Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dom Wright. I'm Head of Client Services at Henderson Row, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to our fourth virtual investor lunch. I'm joined today by Dr. Phil Will, Head of Investment Solutions at our parent company, Raylian. Hi, Phil. Great to see you as always. Great to be here, Dom. Um, and thank you for all joining us today. Uh, I hope that everyone is staying healthy and that you're making the most uh, of the summer of 2021. I should point out that this event is being recorded, and so by joining us today, you consent to that. We found that these virtual events are a fantastic additional arrow to our quiver, but I have to admit, it's great to no longer be 100% reliant upon them. And we've loved meeting so many of you again in the flesh over the last couple of months, either in the office or over lunch. Our business continues to grow despite the pandemic. And today I'm really excited to hear Phil's presentation on scientific investing, algos, AI and alpha, using big data and machine learning to navigate markets. We're always looking at ways that we can upgrade our research process and ensure that we're sucking as much juice as we possibly can from the markets in order to deliver you the best risk adjusted return possible. After his talk, Phil will be answering questions that we sourced from our clients. And as before, we'll finish just before three o'clock. We've taken the precaution of muting all of you today, so there are no, there are no distracting background noises. Uh, otherwise, at the rate that the NHS is going at, who knows, we might all be getting pinged in the next hour or so. Um, before I hand you over to Phil, I'd like to first introduce our charity speaker today, Anna Witten of the Westminster Drug Project, an organization that provides free and confidential support, particularly around employment to people with drug and alcohol problems. The link with Henderson Row is that my investment manager colleague, Kevin Reed, is an ambassador and volunteer for the WDP. So I'm very grateful to Kevin for giving us the opportunity to learn more about the valuable work that they're doing. Hello. I'm Anna Witten, and I'm the Chief Executive of WDP. We are a vibrant and award-winning charity supporting people with drug and alcohol issues. And we don't just work with individuals, we work with their families, we work with local communities. We reach out to individuals to really support, to tackle this very challenging and damaging issue. Um, I don't doubt that a number of you will know people that have been affected by drug and alcohol issues. Um, and I also really hope that what you've seen is that with the right treatment and support, people can absolutely transform their lives and live the lives that they really deserve to have. So in terms of where we are, we operate across London. Uh, we have an inpatient detox and residential rehabilitation unit in Harlow in Essex. Uh, we also work across Cheshire West and Chester um, and those services, so the bulk of our services are community based, they are open access so people can walk into our service sites, they can ring up, they can access us online and then we put together individualised packages of care to support them. And that uh, individualised and comprehensive support is so important. It's important that we work with people to really empower them, to make sure we focus on their strengths and their skills and their abilities, to think about broader health and well-being, that we think about what works for people in terms of online engagement or face-to-face -face engagement, that we really think about all of the factors that will contribute towards happy and healthy lives going forward. And we know that substance misuse comes at a significant cost to individuals, to families, uh, to wider society. And so the impact of our services is important and it's significant. One of the things that we really focus on, and we have a specific service operating across a number of London boroughs for this, is in employment. So really thinking about uh, employment opportunities for people, some of whom have never worked, uh, others have worked um, and experienced challenges and, and dropped out of work and, and need support to rebuild their confidence, to build relationships uh, with new employers and support to sustain employment. And I'm going to play a couple of bits of feedback from our service users regarding our employment focus service. Hi, my name is Simon. I'm a 40-year-old mixed-race male. 
I was introduced to the IPS program in April 2019 due to problems with alcohol. During this time in recovery, I was then introduced to the IPS service. They helped me to get back on my feet by helping me with my CV and also with applications for jobs and also with information in regards to job fairs. I am pleased to announce that over a year now I've been working for a reputable company and look forward to a happy future. This is all due to the help that I've received from the IPS program and would like to thank them very much for all their help in this time. Thank you once again. I started to engage with the IPS in 2019 via WGP as I was in a really good place with my recovery. I was nearly 18 months sober. In February, I was told about a vacancy with MenCap on an as and when basis as a community support worker. I had my interview in February and was successful, but because of COVID-19, I didn't start working with them until September. Since then, I've thoroughly enjoyed the work I do and it's varied as well. It fits in with my daughter's school times, which is what I wanted. The IPS scheme has really helped me in my journey and the IPS employment specialist was amazing and so supportive. They've kept in contact with me throughout. I couldn't be happier with the way things have turned out and now I've been sober for 27 months and still going strong. My life has taken a turn for the better and in the right direction. I can't thank the IPS scheme enough. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the type of impact we can have when the right support is put around people. And for some people... You know, they not believe that they could end up working at all and yet now are in sustainable employment. But there's way more that we can and need to do. Um, we, we need to reach people much earlier. The earlier we can reach people, the better the outcomes for them. Um, and, and essentially services have been disinvested in for some significant period of time whilst need has increased. Family members need more support and they are a really important part of someone's network and a really important part of their recovery. And we're also keen to seek and secure more employment opportunities for service users, but we need more employers on board. So we have people that have amazing skills and abilities um, and we are looking for a whole range of different opportunities for them. And the latest stats really give you a sense of, of why investing in these types of services uh, gives a fantastic return. So for every one pound spent on treatment, we know that savings of around four pounds will be made as a result of reduced amounts on health, prison, law enforcement and emergency services. So that impact, that investment, that important focus on people who can genuinely transform their lives is really, really key. Thank you so much for your time and please get in contact if you'd like to. Thank you so much um, for um, that wonderful video um, and for all uh, um, the good work you do. I imagine that's um, been a, a lot busier uh, in the last uh, year or so. Um, so if you'd like more information or to understand uh, how you can help, um, please get in touch with us. Uh, and now, Phil, over to you. The floor is yours. Thanks, Dom. All right, I will share some slides as well. So I'm happy to be here today. It's always a pleasure to speak at Henderson Row Investor Lunches. Uh, those of you who have been to a lunch before, you're probably aware that Henderson Row um, and Henderson Row's parent company, Railing, at our investment philosophy is based on really two principles. One is that uh, investor psychology, if we understand it, it can help us to avoid common investing pitfalls. Um, and also, maybe even more importantly, by studying behavioral finance, we can determine how other investors make mistakes, how they lead to mispricings, and how we could exploit that to enhance our own performance. Uh, the second principle is that one of the best ways to take advantage of behavioral bias in the market, both in terms of being disciplined so that we can avoid mistakes, but also exploiting others' mistakes, is through systematic strategies. In the past, when I've spoken at investor lunches, I've talked more about the former, about behavioral finance and the sorts of mistakes that individual investors make, the types of errors that uh, institutional asset owners and investors are likely to commit. Today, I'm going to focus on the other side. I'd like to talk about 
uh, the systematic models that we use to, uh, to exploit those mistakes. And in particular, I want to focus on some new tools that we've added to the arsenal, um, some methods from machine learning, big data, and how we're employing those into our investment process. Uh, so I'll talk about data and machine learning, but I also want to focus on how that's changing humans' role in the investment process. Um, there, there's sort of a misperception that as we add new methodologies, as we bring on board uh, new quantitative technology, that it's displacing people. And it turns out that's not really the case. The way I look at it is we're actually just introducing tools uh, that make the work of the people in the process much more efficient and also a lot more effective. So hopefully uh, that'll come through as we talk about um, the, the high level philosophy and what Raliant is doing uh, to make sure that all of these technologies are incorporated in Henderson Row client portfolios. But I'll start with an example that really has nothing to do with investing, an example of how uh, artificial intelligence is changing different fields. Uh, and this example is from game playing. And games, it turns out, are a great test bed when researchers are developing and then when they're trying to evaluate uh, different methodologies for machine learning. Um, this is an example of a game called Go. It's an ancient Chinese board game. Uh, it's at least 2000 years old. And Go is interesting for machine learning researchers because unlike chess, which is a complicated game, uh, but the number of legal positions is small enough that you can still at any point evaluate a vast number of moves and pick the best one. Go is many, many orders of magnitude more complex than chess. And so that strategy doesn't really work. You can't just evaluate a large number of moves with really fast computers. With Go, you need to take a different approach. And so a, a group of researchers at a firm called DeepMind, it was a London-based firm. It was acquired by Google. In 2014, they decided they would create uh, an AI, a machine learning algorithm that would be able to beat the best human players in the world at Go. Um, and they apply something called deep learning. Uh, it's a form of neural network, which is a machine learning technique that's based on the way that neurons learn in the human brain. And they apply deep learning, uh, which basically means having the computer play against itself many, many millions of games. And the computer gradually learns what sorts of patterns constitute good moves in the game. And they were successful with this. So by 2015, they developed a system that was capable of beating the European reigning champion, a guy named Fan Hui. Um, so they won in that match. Uh, they went on to work on the model a bit more. And then in 2016, all of this culminated in a five match, uh, a five game match against uh, a player who's considered one of the greatest players of all time, world champion Lee Seidel of Korea. And the computer defeated C Lee Seidel uh, in a score of four to one. So it was a huge success for the uh, AlphaGo team at DeepMind. Um, and one of the things that comes out when you look at these pictures of human players sort of getting to this question of uh, what's the role of people once machines have come into the picture, uh, you can see the anguish on their faces as they're losing. And there is a great documentary called AlphaGo that describes the development of uh, of the system and, and these uh, matches that it played. And the way that the, the players, after their defeat, they describe playing the machine, um, they, they express frustration that any move that they play, the machine seems to have a perfect response. And then even more interestingly, they made the comment uh, that what they saw from the computer was moves that they would never expect, moves that they didn't understand uh, and then realized later on that it was a very effective move. And they said that it looked as though the, the machine was playing with creativity, which is something that hasn't been said of previous chess playing machines. Um, and, and so this frustration leads to the natural question, uh, does this mean that, that humans really have no place in Go? And we can think about that you know, uh, by analogy to other fields like investing. But I wanna draw attention to two facts about uh, AlphaGo. One is that these systems are not uh, constructed out of thin air. It takes a big group of people to build these systems. So uh, when you look at AlphaGo, they eventually published an article in Nature describing 
uh, how their algorithm worked and describing these matches that it played. And that article had 20 co-authors. So it's a very large team of people building these systems. They're not folks who have been playing Go since they were kids. Most of these are engineers and computer scientists, but nevertheless, there are still people behind the development of these technologies. And those people, it turns out, don't just build the technology, then they go on to maintain and enhance it. So there are always gonna be people involved in the process. And then the second point is, if you look at these pictures, you'll see that this defeated European champion, Fan Hui, he was actually hired by the AlphaGo team after he lost to help make the model better. So they understood that they would need someone who had been playing the game since he was a kid uh, to instill all sorts of fundamental knowledge about the game of Go into the computer and to help them make the model stronger so that it could beat even stronger players. And so there's also a role for what we would refer to as domain experts, people who have a knowledge of the subject matter and they can help to guide the development of intelligent systems um, that, that ultimately just serve as an extension of our human capabilities uh, that make our work faster and better. Now, not surprisingly, uh, Wall Street has been eager to adopt a lot of these new technologies and apply those to make even more money. Uh, and we've seen an explosion. This has been going on for um, at least 10 years now, but it's really accelerated in the last few years of interest in machine learning applied to financial markets. So lots of books being published about machine learning and finance, uh, conferences, webinars, articles in the popular press, academic journals. If you look at top finance journals now, very often they'll publish papers that uh, that make use of machine learning and other um, big data methodologies. Uh, the chart on the right, this is uh, a study that was done of keywords in finance, academic finance articles. And you can see there's been uh, almost exponential growth in the last few years uh, in terms of the number of times these machine learning related keywords come up. Interestingly, the top keyword neural networks, this is a technology that's been around for a long time. People have been trying to apply this in finance for quite some time. This is the methodology that the AlphaGo team used. It was a form of neural network. But one of the things that we found uh, as we've observed machine learning uh, being adopted in finance and uh, for investing in particular is that it hasn't always been very successful. Uh, and there are reasons that machine learning as much as it's promised to revolutionize the way that we uh, invest that it hasn't always lived up to that hype. So I want to talk about why that might be the case, and then I'll get into how we're addressing that issue. Um, the, the big problem with uh, financial markets is that in some sense, if you think about it uh, as a game, the rules of the game are changing. They're not fixed. And that's not the case with most domains in which people have tried to apply machine learning. So if you think about machine learning, what is it at its core? It's taking a huge amount of data and recognizing that there's a structure in the data somewhere, there's a pattern there, and machines are just really good at processing data and finding those patterns. And once you know the pattern, then you can start making predictions. Um, there's a great website called Kaggle. This is a user community. Uh, they were also acquired by Google, uh, but it's basically a website that posts contests and they have sponsors that post contests. And the contests consist of uh, a data set. So it's uh, a data set that's posted as a training data set. Uh, there's a description of what the data are. And then users on the website, they'll actually use the training data to build models. And they'll try to build a model to make predictions on a test data set. The test data set is one for which they don't know the answers and they're evaluated and scored in these contests. So a bunch of users submit uh, machine learning models. The website scores those models. And then sometimes the, the winning contestants get, uh, they get a medal on the website, which is sort of like bragging rights. Sometimes they get a monetary prize and the monetary prizes can actually be uh, fairly sizable. Um, and when you look at the types of contests that are offered, usually uh, they take the form of the contest on the right. This is an entry level uh, competition. It's a set of images of cats and dogs. And the idea is to create an AI that will successfully discriminate between the cats and dogs. Um, and clearly there's a lot of structure in those data. If you understand what a cat looks like and you understand what a dog looks like, you'll be able to make accurate predictions 
uh, about these pictures. So that's not particularly challenging. But in financial markets, things are different. So uh, as academics have continued studying financial markets, more and more you're seeing financial markets viewed as living organisms. They're viewed as an ecosystem. And we understand that they evolve over time. And they evolve in a way that's not random. And this is something that's long been recognized by practitioners and academics have started taking this view up as well. Uh, George Soros called it reflexivity. Um, there's an academic uh, professor at MIT, Andrew Lowe, uh, who refers to the adaptive markets hypothesis. And the idea is that trading changes the market. When traders trade, they bid prices up, they send prices down when they sell. And so uh, when we see a mispricing in the market, if you see an anomaly that creates predictability where I could predict that a stock is overvalued or undervalued, what happens is that a lot of capital flows in to try to address that opportunity and that trading changes things. It actually eliminates the predictability. So in financial markets, there's a lot of noise and there's not a lot of structure because whenever there is some bias that's perceptible, traders are going in and trying to eliminate it. That's how competition in financial markets makes prices correct. It's a self-correcting mechanism. But the upshot is it's hard for methods like neural networks, it's hard for those to find the structure in the data. And there's a paper that was written about this, about the challenge of machine learning and finance. And the way they described it, they said, uh, with, with analogy to this cats and dogs challenge, cats don't begin morphing into dogs as soon as the algorithm becomes good at cat recognition. And that really sums up the problem with trying to apply certain machine learning methods uh, in the area of finance. Now, we find it's possible to overcome those challenges. And there are two ways uh, that we typically think about uh, surmounting this obstacle. The first is model selection. And it turns out there are many, many models we could choose from when we're building machine learning tools for investing. And some are better than others. So neural networks are famous for being able to find uh, structure in data to an arbitrary level of precision, but they depend on the data being less noisy. And if there's a lot of noise in the data, if there's a lot of randomness, um, they'll often fit to that noise. And then when you try to use the model to make predictions after you've trained it, it doesn't work so well in the real world. There are other methods. And one of those that I'll talk about a little bit is something called uh, tree-based models. And tree-based models are less susceptible to that type of overfitting, and they tend to work better in an application like finance. But the more important element of making machine learning work in financial markets is something that they refer to in the machine learning domain as, as feature engineering. And feature engineering is just recognizing that machine learning is about learning from data, but you have to input the data. We have to supply the machine with examples that it can learn from. And if we give it higher quality data, and importantly, if we give it data that has hints about where to go looking for structure and patterns, then the machine is going to be more effective at finding those. And so this is where there's a real place for humans in the process is coming up with better data and then letting the machine sort out how to best use the data to make predictions. And this is something that's been recognized by users on that website, Kaggle, uh, the top contestants, um, including this Kaggle grandmaster, Sergey Jurgensen, uh, who said that feature engineering is the art part of data science. They recognize that to win these contests, probably the greatest skill is actually in building the best features to make predictions. Um, and, and even better quote, I think, comes from Andrew Ng uh, at Stanford. So he's a professor of computer science, um, probably one of the most well-known researchers in machine learning. He was one of the founders of Google Brain, and he was actually, until recently, uh, chief scientist at Baidu, which is China's answer to Google. Um, he said that coming up with features is difficult, time-consuming. It's what requires expert knowledge. Um, and, and so he's basically saying here that you need domain experts, you need Fan Hui to help the Google team uh, build this AlphaGo model with the knowledge of an expert Go player. For our purposes, we need people who have financial knowledge who can build um, good data to input to our machine learning. Um, Andrew Ng said, 
applied machine learning is basically just feature engineering. So recognizing the importance of choosing the right model, recognizing the importance of coming up with the best inputs, uh, it, it actually creates a lot of scope for humans to play an important role in this process. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the uh, precise ways that Reliant is introducing machine learning and big data uh, into the models that underlie Henderson Row client portfolios. First, I'm gonna give two more examples very briefly from other domains, just to show you what these tree-based models look like. So a decision tree, the basic idea is you start with an example. Um, it's, a, it's a set of data representing one unit. It could be a patient coming into a hospital. Um, it could be the bank of a river where we're worried about a landslide. It could be a stock and we're trying to evaluate whether it's a good or a bad investment. So the example on the left, this is a decision tree from the field of medical research. Decision trees have been used frequently um, in medicine because it's really great to have, uh, you know, for, for someone doing diagnostics, it's great to have a set of yes or no questions that you can ask and answer and then come up with uh, a diagnosis or a prognosis. This is uh, a tree that was used in emergency departments when a patient presents with chest pain. Uh, the question is, how likely is it this person's got heart failure? Uh, and this would help to triage. And so you ask questions about the patient. You ask, what is the patient's uh, blood urea nitrogen level? What is their systolic blood pressure and so on? And if you ask enough of these questions, you can come up with a prediction about the level of risk um, that that patient has heart failure. The, the chart on the right, this is a machine learning decision tree uh, that's using data from groundwater sensors along the Yangtze River uh, and trying to predict landslides. And so the idea here is the machine learns the structure in the data, the machine figures out which are the right uh, series of questions to ask, what are the implications of a certain set of answers, but it's humans that supply the data. It's humans that supply the actual questions themselves. And to the extent that you can create better medical tests, if you can build greater, better sensors to put in the ground and measure water levels, um, you can design inputs that help the machine to learn better and make better predictions. So now finally, I wanna briefly walk through an example, um, the, an applied example. This is actually something that we're doing to evaluate stocks. This is a decision tree that we've created at Reliant. Um, it's a much bigger decision tree. So here we're asking over 800 different yes or no questions. Uh, and it's based on around 125 different variables that we've selected as input data. And so the idea here is again, a stock starts at the left of this chart. And through a series of questions that we ask about the stock, we work ourselves down to one of these so-called root nodes in the tree where we have a prediction about the stock's return over the next month. Um, these models are built by teams of quantitative researchers who select the methodology. Um, they help to code all the questions into the system, but we've also got researchers with lots of domain knowledge. So people who are finance experts who are coming up with the best types of questions to ask. And so in some sense, this is just increasing our bandwidth because this is a model that we apply to 80,000 stocks in our equity universe. It's hard for human analysts uh, to evaluate companies with that degree of breadth. Uh, this is also a tree that incorporates knowledge of 35 years of uh, equity investing. So there's a lot of information that goes into these models. Now, zooming in, just so you can see what this process looks like, uh, I've selected a few branches here just to show you how a stock would flow through this model. Um, so uh, this is not the top of the tree, but we've worked ourselves down to this stage. Um, and we ask of a stock, given all that we know about the stock already, what's the stock's bankruptcy probability? And this is where we've actually got a team of people who created a model to try to estimate um, the likelihood that a company is going to go into bankruptcy. And based on the answer to that question, not surprisingly, a company with a high likelihood of bankruptcy is probably going to have a negative future return. So the prediction here is if it's got a high likelihood of bankruptcy, next month's return is expected to be negative 19%. If it's got low probability of bankruptcy, we go to the next branch. And so the question is, what is the stock price? Is it high or low? This is not asking if the stock is cheap or expensive. Um, this is asking, what is the number? What is the absolute dollar amount of the stock price? And it turns out that if a company's got a low stock price, 
that company is much more likely to be targeted by individual investors. They tend to conflate a low price with a cheap stock. And so low price stocks actually tend to be overvalued. And so the model is saying, if this is a company, even with a low probability of distress, if it's got a very low stock price, we expect that all things equal, it's going to have negative returns. If it's got a higher stock price, so if the stock price isn't extremely low, if it's not a penny stock, um, then let's evaluate its price to sales ratio. And this is the question where we're asking, is this a cheap or expensive stock relative to fundamentals? And what the models realized is that if a stock has a low price to sales, if you can buy a dollar's worth of sales for less than a dollar, um, then this is an inexpensive stock. This is the well-known value effect. So the model recognizes stocks with low valuation ratios are more likely to have um, positive future returns. But the model understands that just because a stock has a high price to sales ratio, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad investment. So the next question is, what's the stock's operating profitability? And it's important to note the machine figured this out on its own. So the machine understands if it's an expensive stock, we've got to do more work. Is it a profitable company? Because we understand a profitable company is very good at turning sales into profits. So even if a company has a high price to sales ratio, if they're really good at converting those sales into earnings, it might still be a good investment. And so if it's got high profitability, the model again predicts positive returns. If it's got low profitability, we're going to ask a bunch of other questions. But on average, stocks with low probability that are very expensive, um, tend not to be good investments. They tend to produce negative returns. But presumably, if we keep working our way through the tree, we might ask and answer some questions that tell us this is a growth stock. And even though it's expensive now, even though it's not profitable, there are reasons to believe that that profitability is coming. So this is basically how the system works. And again, the idea is the better questions that we can provide to the model, the better the predictions are going to be and the more effective the investment process is. And I'll emphasize, um, this is just a tool. So this is helping us to evaluate stocks. Uh, we're not letting these decision trees completely dictate what a portfolio looks like. We're just using this as a way to evaluate tens of thousands of stocks that we could never do if we had to have um, human beings unassisted looking at those companies individually. So hopefully this has given you a sense for some of the promise of machine learning, what it might be able to achieve in investments, some of the challenges that make that difficult in the domain of finance, and um, some of the specific ways that we're trying to overcome that. Uh, I'll stop there and I'll turn it over to Dom uh, so we can do some question and answer. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Phil, thanks so much for that. That was a uh, really fascinating uh, presentation. I think you, you know, a really interesting kind of look under the bonnet uh, of what uh, sort of our research team, you know, you guys are sort of doing and how you're thinking and um, helping us construct portfolios. So I think that was really uh, fascinating. Um, there's also um, a series of very interesting uh, documentaries on BBC at the moment by Adam Curtis on machine learning, which are, are sort of well worth uh looking at uh, as well um so yeah absolutely um phil on to the q a um first question for you phil is um you're head of the investment solutions team uh, obviously at radiant can you just explain what the investment solutions team does and how is that different from just sort of pure research um perhaps you can give us um a quick day in the life of phil wool um as well yeah so Investment solutions, when I'm asked to explain this, I guess, you know, it most frequently comes up when I'm introducing myself on a call um, with a client. I, I usually describe it briefly as half my time I'm doing research, half my time uh, I'm out in the world talking with clients, uh, presenting at conferences, writing papers and, and research notes and things that, um, that we publish to explain our strategies both to our clients, but also um, try to get our views out into the broader uh, investing community. Um, I, I, sometimes I think about it in relation to my past life in the academic world. Uh, in many ways, um, it's sort of like the life of a professor at a research university where you spend half your time doing research and publishing papers, uh, and then the other half of your time you're working with students. So now I don't have students. Um, I'm working with our clients. Uh, but I, I always found that rewarding. You know, it's the, the research is nice, but I also like to see how it's being applied. Um, and so investment solutions really combines the best of both worlds. I'll say 
in relation to working as a professor, one of the big differences is that when I was doing research at the university, it only had a, a very minor connection to what I was teaching in the classroom. You know, the curriculum isn't necessarily uh, offering what's on the cutting edge of finance research. Um, but in this role in investment solutions, there's a lot more interplay between the research and the, and the interaction with clients. So very often it's things that I learned from clients about the challenges uh, that they're facing with their portfolios, different constraints that they're trying to overcome. Uh, that feeds back directly into the research. So there's a lot more communication between what's happening in the field and what's happening, you know, behind the computers on the research team. And the, the, the way I think about investment solutions ultimately is it's just an interface between the research and everything that the research touches, whether that's portfolios that are being traded um, as live strategies or the marketing materials that we're putting out to describe, you know, what differentiates our approach. And even these journal articles that we're writing because we want, uh, we want to um, make our views uh, more widely available in the investing community, you know, the benefits of machine learning, for example, or um, the benefits of systematic uh, investing based on behavioral finance more generally. So, um, you know, I think that hopefully kind of gives a sense for what's different about uh, investment solutions and where it departs from sort of pure research. Yeah, um, thanks. Well, that's, that's very interesting. I mean, interesting, you talked about um, sort of students and your, and your sort of teaching, I guess now is a natural point um, to sort of say that we, um, many of our, our clients have talked to us um, over the years about um, wanting to involve their children more with Henderson Road, uh, either because they're doing um, sort of intergenerational planning, uh, the children are considering a, cheer, a career in finance or, or just because they'd like them to learn more uh, about um, investing. Um, and so, you know, Phil has very kindly agreed to um, to run a sort of next generation um, sort of Zoom course specifically for clients' children, um, you know, sort of teaching investing kind of 101, uh, if you like. Um, so, you know, who better to be doing that and um, explain the difference between sort of um, speculating uh, and investing um, than Phil. So um, yeah, we look forward to that uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming months. Um, our next question, um, Phil, we've been talking uh, about machine learning for a while now um, to clients and it sounds very exciting, um, but how will this technology meaningfully benefit my portfolio? Yeah, so I, I, I kind of touched on this in the talk, but I think, uh, you know, the principal benefit is one of, um, it's one of efficiency and of breadth. So uh, it's, researching stocks is hard work. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into collecting the data that a human analyst would look at and then processing the data. And I, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking with uh, people who have been doing fundamental research for a very long time. And the sense I get is that uh, just speaking with people, the maximum number of stocks that one human analyst can adequately cover is from maybe six to 12 stocks. So it's a small number of stocks. But as I said, we've got tens of thousands of equities in our universe. And so um, unless you've got a team of thousands of analysts, it's going to be hard to cover um, the, the full universe of stocks. So quantitative methods and machine learning in particular, they just help to create uh, investment methodologies that have wider breadth. We can cover a much wider part of the universe. And so if there are opportunities, you know, we don't know where mispricing is going to occur. If there are opportunities in the part of market um, that would have been harder to cover with human analysts, you know, usually you'll focus on the biggest cap companies. Often that's not where the best opportunities are. Um, with machine learning, we can just cover a much wider set of stocks. Um, but then in terms of the actual research process beyond just covering a larger number of securities, uh, I, I like to think of machine learning as um, helping to computerize the parts of the process that are really um, routinized, kind of mechanistic, anything that requires uh, statistics or calculation. Um, these are things that humans can do it, uh, but we're just really slow at making calculations. And very often, just for the sake of speed, we've got to fall back on heuristics or rules of thumb, uh, what I'd really like to do is just put any of the math and statistics onto the computer and then focus my time and my researchers' time on finding good data, finding better signals. Um, that's something that computers still have a hard time doing. You know, they're really good at synthesizing information once they've got it, but actually coming up with the information in the first place, humans are better at that. 
Um, and so what machine learning does for us is it allows us to very explicitly uh, reallocate our time and spend a lot less time doing calculations and a lot more time um, doing the actual economic and intuitive and uh, sort of field work to develop good data sets and then come up with good trading signals to feed into the model. So I think those are the benefits as we see the predictions getting better, um, the portfolio uh, having a lot more scope to look at securities across the market. Uh, that's why it's because the, the computers are sort of taking the grunt work uh, off of the backs of our researchers and allowing us to focus more deeply on, you know, finding good signals and data. I think you're muted, Dom. Thanks, Bill. Um, only been doing Zoom calls for a year and a half now, so I'm still learning the trade. Um, yeah, Phil, thanks for that. Lots of um, tangible benefits there. Um, it's great. Um, to change topic slightly, um, and, and to move on to sort of US politics and geopolitics, um, do you think that President Biden will get his enormous uh, multi-trillion dollar um, human infrastructure bill passed? Um, can the, can the US even afford it? And is it going to lead to inflation? Right. So, you know, we're, it's, things are different since Trump left office. It used to be much more fun talking about US politics, but now we actually have to talk about, uh, you know, real fiscal matters and, and data. Um, so there, there's been a lot of action, even in the last 24 hours in the, in the question of these, um, these spending packages. There's, there are really two bills. So one is bipartisan. Um, that was a bill that was, it was supposed to be around $600 billion. It was to be spent on physical infrastructure. Um, so that one has actually moved forward in the Senate to a vote. Uh, that bill, it, as I said, was supposed to be around $600 billion. It's been reduced to $500 billion. Um, that's going to be paying for utilities, broadband, transport. Uh, that's not the controversial bill. I think the, the, the bill that more people are talking about and worried about in terms of how we're going to afford it is the, uh, the partisan bill. This is the so-called social infrastructure bill, um, spending on childcare, education, climate change. Uh, originally, this was meant to be, or I should say, you know, 48 hours ago, it was going to be a three and a half trillion dollar spending bill. Uh, this did not have support of Republicans, so Democrats were trying an end run where they would uh, they'd secure a budget resolution that would allow them to put this bill through or put the spending through with only the 50 votes that Senate Democrats have. Um, but there was a lot of controversy. It wasn't just Republicans. Democrats were also a little bit uncomfortable um, with the dollar amount. So within the last 24 hours, a senator in Arizona said that she, a uh, Democratic senator said she wouldn't support a three and a half trillion dollar spending package. She would let the ball uh, get rolling, but she wouldn't approve unless the number came down. So now it's clear it won't be three and a half trillion dollars. It's going to be something considerably less. In terms of how it's going to be paid for, uh, the the I guess the particulars haven't been very clear. Um, Democrats have generally said that it would be tax hikes, but the tax increases on the slate right now, they're about half as much as you would need to pay for the full three and a half trillion. Um, so it's clear that there would have to be some debt involved as well. Uh, that's making lots of people uncomfortable. Um, clearly more debt, greater likelihood of inflation. And in fact, we we've seen higher numbers in terms of inflation in the last few months, and that's given Republicans talking points that they've been using to challenge the idea of adding more debt um, and, and further increasing the risk of price increases. Um, thanks, thanks, Phil. And you, and you sort of alluded um, to inflation in, in your answer there. Um, inflation is definitely a hot topic at the moment. Um, if we do see um, persistent inflation, how will our scientific and, and quant driven approach uh, account for that? Yeah, this is something we talked about a bit in uh, the recently uploaded quarterly note. Um, the, the last few months, as I said, we've seen rising prices. So US CPI, each month, it's been a surprisingly high number. June was particularly disturbing. It was a 5.4% headline CPI, um, which is the, is the second highest CPI in 30 years. Uh, the, the first highest is just a sort of a blip. Oil hit $150 a barrel. Uh, back in 2008, um, the, the question on investors' minds, and I think this kind of dictates how uh, the uncertainty and how we respond, 
is whether that is permanent inflation or it's just temporary. And we'd expect there's going to be some inflation because if you look at year over year changes a year ago, where were we? Well, we were right at the outset of the pandemic and prices had plummeted. Um, so when you look at year over year changes, obviously now we'd expect to see some increases. And the question is just, will that be sustained? Um, one of the ways you can look at that is you can start to break down the inflation statistics uh, and, and take a deeper dive on the numbers. So people have computed core CPI, which strips out energy. We know, uh, you know oil is way up. Um, since a year ago, it strips out food prices, which are volatile. That was 4.5%. So it's a bit lower, uh, but that's still the highest reading of core CPI in 30 years. Um, uh, uh, maybe a more optimistic number is the trimmed CPI, which is just taking out all the outliers. So, you know, car rentals up 90% year over year in price, uh, used cars up 50%. Um, and, and so if you take those out, the number is 2.9%, which is, you know, again, it's a bit higher than uh, recent history over the last 15 years, but it's not quite as concerning. So uh, I, long story short, part of this is definitely temporary and we don't have to worry about it. Um, now, uh, there is a risk of higher inflation than what we've experienced. That's obviously not great for portfolios. Interestingly, if you look at what the market's saying, uh, stocks and bonds are hitting record highs. So the market is apparently not concerned with inflation. They uh, tend to agree with the Fed that this is temporary. Um, but when we think about positioning our portfolios, we're obviously worried about the counterfactual. You know, what's, uh, what if all of this is wrong um, and there is higher inflation? Uh, and then you can think about certain ways of dealing with it. One is you don't want to be holding cash, obviously. Uh, bonds are unattractive. Uh, bonds right now are priced as though there's not going to be any inflation. They're uh, at extremely low yields. Um, and so fixed income is not very attractive. Equities can be a great place, even if there's moderate inflation. Equities start to uh, see more trouble if inflation is persistently very high. Um, and, and so within equities, you know, that's probably a place where allocation is more successful in an inflationary environment. Uh, the best assets during a period of inflation are things like commodities. But the research that we've done suggests that commodities are an expensive hedge. You know, it's buying insurance. They're going to go up if we have super high inflation. But in the meantime, commodity returns are generally very poor um, compared to equities or even fixed income over longer horizons. And so it's good to have a little bit of an allocation of commodities as a hedge, but you don't want to completely shift your asset allocation. Um, within equities, it turns out there are things you can do to protect against inflation, and we're already doing those things. So looking at value stocks, stocks that are sort of cheap versus fundamentals, and importantly, looking at high quality companies, companies that are more likely to be able to pass on cost increases to customers, so companies with high margins, for example, you know, like the companies working their way through that tree that we talked about, um, those would be stocks that would hold up better if we see inflation. And so it's something that we think about uh, but we think about it in a systematic way. You know, we're not making massive shifts in the asset allocation uh, on the basis of a fear that might never play out. And, you know, that can be a, a sort of costly way of reacting to these types of data. Thanks, Phil, for that. Um, uh, last two questions. We've got about 10 minutes um, left uh, in our slot today. Um, UK mortgage rates are at rock bottom. Um, UK banks are currently offering five-year fixed rates at just over 1%. That's fallen sharply even in 2021, uh, implying that banks think there's even less chance of a Bank of England rate hike now than there was back in January. Um, are we going to be in this ultra-low interest rate world forever? Um, can they ever raise rates? So it gets harder to raise rates um, the more debt there is, because then there's a challenge rolling over government debt. Um, you know, so we just talked about the, the infrastructure plan. You know, clearly, to the extent that this type of spending is happening, and it's become uh, pretty commonplace in the, in the COVID world to see government spending massive amounts of money, um, to see governments keeping rates really low uh, to try to stimulate growth. Um, and even the Fed has expressed this notion that as inflation does start to creep up, that they're willing to tolerate inflation running a little bit hotter than it has in the past, 
um, before they actually step in and start intervening with rate hikes. And so central banks are signaling that they're comfortable with a bit more inflation. Uh, that suggests to me that they don't have any plans in uh, raising rates anytime soon. Um, and, and again, there are there are other reasons just in terms of you know countries' debt burden uh, to keep rates artificially low. So I would expect the low rate environment uh, will, will persist for some time. Um, excellent, Bill, thank you. And um, lastly, we've talked a lot um, so far about the effects of inflation um, and our low rate environment. Uh, so with that being said, how do you create an investment strategy that has multi-year success? So, yeah, so there's a lot going on. There's, um, you know, on the one hand, you've got the, the pandemic, and that obviously was, was very disruptive to financial markets. And then, you know, now we're in a, in a rally that, that many have speculated looks a bit like a bubble in certain places. Um, now the, the prospect of inflation, there's all sorts of geopolitical risk. You know, I'm constantly thinking about uh, the relationship between the U.S. and China, for example. Um, you know, there's Brexit and, and so many different, uh, different challenges for investors. And the question is, how do you react to that challenge and, and build portfolios, as you say, that are geared for long-term success? Um, I haven't talked about behavioral finance as much today, uh, but when I think about all of the events going on, you know, the, the ultra high inflation numbers, depending on how you look at it, um, the fact that uh, that Elon Musk can move cryptocurrencies by, you know, double digit percentage points with a tweet, uh, meme stocks, um, and, and all of these other things. I, I, what, one of the conclusions that I draw or, or that I reaffirm is that financial markets are really good in the long run um, at reflecting information in prices. In the short run, markets don't seem to be as efficient at processing information. Um, and, and so this is when I would say, you know, the fact that we're talking about this stuff so much, clearly we have a visceral reaction um, to a lot of these events that are taking place. That's exactly when I would want to step back and think about things more systematically. You know, that's where I like our process uh, that's more data driven and it's based on uh, rigorous discipline decision making. Um, and and, and there, there are sort of two responses at a high level. One is at the portfolio level, don't make uh, massive changes to asset allocation on the basis of short-term information because a lot of it's not information, a lot of it is just noise. Um, you should make asset allocation decisions on the basis of being diversified uh, and, and basically setting up a portfolio that's hedged to all manner of risk. Um, and then to take advantage of these events that are taking place, at the stock level, so within the portfolio, when I'm thinking about stock selection, then I would want models that are able to pick up mispricing when other investors misreact to information. And so I think that combination of a broadly diversified portfolio that's got good exposure um, to what we, we know in the long run is going to be economic growth. So that would be a portfolio that's relatively concentrated in equities. Um, to the extent that an investor can tolerate the volatility. Uh, and then at the individual security level, a portfolio that's designed to exploit behavioral bias uh, through stock picking, whether it's human analysis or increasingly uh, work that's aided by machine learning and all of these sources of data that we can get our hands on. Yeah, thanks, but I think uh, if this year has shown us anything, it's, it's how difficult it is to be sort of making predictions. And so uh, making decisions sort of based on data is, is definitely the way, um, way forward, I think. Um, well, Phil, thank you very much uh, for your time um, today and for all your kind of comments. Um, and thank you very much for everyone else for joining us today. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, non-virtually for one of these uh, events, uh, hopefully soon in the coming months. Um, but until then, um, yeah, please all stay healthy and safe and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Tom. Take care, Thanks. everybody. Thanks, Thank Bob. you.